Again, my name is Michael Garadel. My role with STCU is uh, in, in the relationship of uh, uh, retirement planning, financial planning, and investment services. My responsibility is for that, to oversee that part of STCU's business. So I'm glad to be here today. I love Wagstaff. It looks like a fantastic organization. I see these huge buildings. I told Wade, I have to have a, a tour because I see these huge buildings. I don't know what you guys are doing in there. So I want to go check it out and see what, uh, see what it's all about. Uh, but I know you're a phenomenally successful organization. So congratulations, a great place to be. So we'll start. And again, um, let me know if you have any questions as we race through it. Financial planning uh, 101. STCU has financial planning services and retirement planning services through our relationship with a investment firm, a broker dealer, investment firm. It's called CFS, QSO Financial Services. And the reason why I bring that up is that all institutions like banks and credit unions who provide financial planning services have to utilize some form of professional investment firm in order to, to bring it to you. Ours is QSO Financial Services, CFS. Our agenda today is talk about an acronym called PLAN, P-L-A-N, and that's how you really build the foundation for a financial plan. And then we'll talk a little bit even about investing basics. I know probably a lot of you have investments through your retirement account. Everybody have a 401k or retirement account here? So you're investors already, believe it or not. Even if you didn't think you were, you are. You're investing, so congratulations. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the investing basics as well. But we'll, talk, we'll start with the acronym PLAN, P-L-A-N, as building a foundation for your financial planning effort. P, stand for pay yourself first. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Pay yourself first. Put yourself at the front of that line in terms of uh, making sure that you have enough, that you're, um, you're, you're saving for yourself. L, live within your means. Uh, no, making sure we're not overextended in credit. And I have some interesting statistics to share with you about um, people who perhaps are living a little bit out of their means. We get to A, assure their financial, uh, your family's financial stability. Make Making sure that you protect your family. I will say that, maybe I'll repeat it, hopefully not, but the one thing that can destroy a solid financial plan or retirement plan is not having the appropriate type of stability, financial stability for you, for your family, for your loved ones. And then never stop learning. I mean, you're here today to continue to learn about uh, the financial planning process and I uh, compliment you for doing so. Anybody out there have a financial plan that you're currently utilizing for your direction of saving for the future? Make sure it's a, um, it is a living, breathing plan. We don't need a leather bound document that sits on a shelf or a coffee table and looks really nice. We need something that really gets down into the meat and is updated at least on an annual basis. Never stop learning. So how do you pay yourself first? Take advantage of your employer's plan uh, at least to the limit and we always uh, talk to our members at least to the limit of any matching that could be provided by your plan, by your organization. Make sure you're participating in your employer's retirement plan, 401k, 403b, whatever it is. Here's probably 401k, right? Uh, that plan, as you know, allows you to put away money uh, on a, uh, a tax-advantaged basis, so it comes out of your gross pay, right? So your net pay actually gets taxed perhaps a little bit lower, a little bit less. So you're actually putting money away at a gross income level as opposed to after taxes have been taken out. So that's uh, one benefit. The other benefit is that ongoing, consistent, put money into the program type of uh, approach. And we call that dollar cost averaging. But what is, that? what is that? That just means that we're putting money away consistently, usually a fixed amount, right? Every month, kind of a little bit more goes into the retirement plan, right? And with that fixed amount that's going in, you all are investors. In that 401k, you have a menu of investment choices. They're called mutual funds, right? Everybody recognize that term, mutual funds? And you're putting money into these mutual funds sometimes when they're performing very well, and just like the housing market, when the housing market is doing very well, what happens to the prices of houses? They go up. So when investment accounts are doing well, guess what they do? They cost more to put money into. So kind of like purchasing a home or purchasing anything that rises in value, when, when your investment accounts are doing well, you're putting money in consistently, but maybe it's at a more lofty level in terms of its value. 
And when the markets are not doing well, whether it's the bond market, the stock market, uh, fixed rate market, interest rates, uh, when those are not doing so well, you're actually putting in the same amount of money, right, each month, and it's buying a little, maybe a little bit more maybe a little bit more because the prices have depressed on the uh, investments that you're using. That's called dollar cost averaging. The beauty of that over time, the beauty of that is that studies have shown that as you purchase in and out, in and out, over a period of time to where prices are high and prices are low of your investments, you get an average price, which is to your benefit overall, instead of saying, okay, I'm just gonna put all of my retirement money into one investment account one day, one time, one price, and hope that I do well with it. You're actually putting money in over a longer period of time and capturing that investment at different levels of its value. Does that make sense? So the beauty of that sort of investing for you, for your retirement, is that you're able to do that automatically. It's just consistently coming out of your paycheck on a consistent basis and purchasing into your investments. The one thing I will ask you to do though is make sure that you're looking at your retirement plan at least annually. Looking at it in a way to ensure that it is properly properly invested for your level of risk. And we'll talk about that in a little while too. Living within your means. I think I had a statistic on this I'll share with you. Financial fitness being a long-term commitment. Uh, it, it's, we find that that individuals tend to overextend themselves a little bit throughout their lives and perhaps buy on credit and move their credit card payments very high. And the third component is that if you can't afford it now, maybe don't buy it. I mean, that's the sound financial planning advice. If you can't afford it, don't buy it now. Wait until you can. A study came out, and I actually have a stat on it. Maybe I can remember it off the top of my head because it just came out not long ago. The average person who has revolving credit card debt, that's just debt that's sitting on your credit cards month in, month out. Revolving credit card debt is currently at about $8,000, a little over $8,000 per uh, on, their, on their credit cards. $8,000 debt. Can you imagine that? You have $8,000 on your credit card revolving and they pay an interest at 18.9% average interest rate. They're paying, guess how much per year? Just on interest alone. $1,200. $1,200. That's the average credit card balance. It's amazing how we can overextend ourselves and then suddenly find that $1,300 is going into just paying interest on that revolving credit and not paying down the actual balance due. So paying off credit cards on a monthly basis, if you can charge it, you should be able to, to pay it off. And that's sound advice from a financial planning perspective. Assuring your family's stability. I just have to keep looking back because I'm not sure of this roller if I'm going to roll a few slides up. Assuring your family's stability. What does that mean? You know, estate planning. I know it sounds like a big term and I've talked to many members, many clientele that we work with in the financial planning services about estate planning. It's like, holy cow, are you kidding? That's, just, that's for the rich and famous to do some sort of estate planning. That's for people who have lots and lots of assets all over the place to do estate planning. Uh, that's something really big. It's actually for all of us. And at the very least, we have a will uh, that's being updated um, I, from time to time, uh, typically no more than every five years that you're reviewing your will to ensure that it is still up to date or that you have a, um, a living trust account that you establish. Many of these things are so user friendly now. You can almost do these things online for very, very little expense, if any. So there's a lot of resources out there to develop a will for yourselves, develop a living trust for all of your assets that you have, whether it's your home or other assets that you have, to title them into a living trust. And these things are really, they really are estate planning. And what you're doing is you're providing direction, legal direction, that defines what happens to your assets uh, at a point in time to where they need to be distributed because of your death or whatever may come up in, in, in terms of the direction from the uh, living trust or will. Will, obviously, after death. Living trust is a living document. Each of those should be 
updated at least every five years, depending upon your situation, probably reviewed even more frequently, maybe every three years. Uh, so in, I would ask you to take a look at those uh, types of estate planning tools. That sounds like a big term, like estate planning is too much, too big, too, too massive for me to, to, to really wrap my head around D having at least an updated will and the, perhaps a living trust. Now those are done by, uh, by, by attorneys or families of attorneys or, or their legal documents. Um, so if you need a resource, you can always let us know. Maybe we can refer a resource to you that, that works uh, through STCU or, or at least that we may know and provide you a few resources. But, but still, those things are important to you. The last thing about ensuring your uh, family's stability is insurance. And most people look at insurance and say, well, that's not life insurance, it's like death insurance, right? It's like, well, I'm only gonna use it when I die, so why am I gonna be worried about uh, life insurance? But it actually is, a, is a, an, not only an estate planning tool for you to make sure that your, your family and your assets are protected, things like the mortgage on your home, other <coughs> assets that you may have, uh, your boat, your cars, all things that, that make sure that you have your family protected so that they can continue to live in their current lifestyle, something should happen to you. And vice versa, if you are married or you have a significant other or spouse, that making sure that they have the appropriate life insurance as well. These types of uh, plans need to be updated on every five-year basis as well, or as you see, life changes. Uh, maybe there's uh, children or grandchildren. It's a good time to review your uh, estate plan, your living trust, as well as your life insurance to make sure. And life insurance is not only but I call late night TV term insurance, you know, $40 a month and we'll insure you for the next 10 years. The term insurance is for a very fixed need that you have, like a mortgage, you're tying it to a mortgage payment or something of that regard. But life insurance is a little bit more uh, of, a, uh, of a plan for financial planning. And it is a plan that helps to, to identify needs that you may have further down the road and not just death could be for uh, long-term care, uh, could be for um, uh, using the cash buildup in life insurance for funding certain things, maybe college education for children or grandchildren, uh, could be used by, by you in case something should happen that you need to trigger that money or the cash value of it in order to uh, supplement your income for a period of time. So there's a lot of strategies with life insurance, so please don't be afraid of it. I spoke about long-term care um, as being one of the components of life insurance. As we get to our 50s, mid-50s, or, or older, we should be looking at life insurance and especially long-term care. A statistic that came out recently about long-term care is that individuals who are 65 years of age, or around that age of 65 at this point in time, the statistic is at 70% or slightly over 70% actually, 70% will need some form of long-term care, will need to utilize some form of long-term care, 70%. Guess what the percentage is of, that, uh, of those uh, individuals who actually have some form of long-term care? less than 30%. So although it's identified and people agree that, yeah, I'll probably need long-term care, it's the number one area of, uh, of concern or risk to your estate plan, to your, spousal, uh, your spouse or significant other being able to uh, continue to live in the lifestyle, uh, even after maybe you're, you, you've passed away, uh, after long-term care insurance is being used and you don't have a plan to cover for it, it's, uh, it can destroy your estate plan. It can, it can also destroy, ultimately, your retirement plan. So it's one of the biggest areas. So I would ask, under a financial planning arrangement, that you look at long-term care and life insurance as two components that need to be uh, discussed, especially, uh, as I say, when you get into your 50s, uh, early to mid 50s, uh, start that discussion and look at what's available to you. Many people look to long-term care and life insurance when they get to be 65, 70 years old, and guess what? Yeah. Too, expensive. Too expensive, why? <laughs> life. Right, you're right. Life and, and uh, health uh, has, uh, has not been maybe as good as what it could be. So you want to look at these type of things when, uh, when you're healthy 
and when it's most appropriate uh, for you to, to be looking out for yourselves and your, and your spouse and your loved ones. And then lastly, never stop learning. And we'll talk a little bit about investing basics. So P-L-A-N, um, pay yourself first, live within your means, make sure you have that protection um, coverage for your family, and then never stop learning. So what is never stop learning? In order to really have an approach of using financial planning to guide you towards your goals, you need to identify them. You need to identify what your goals are. Most people turn to financial planning because they want to ensure that they have some form of direction for uh, retirement. That's the number one uh, goal of financial plan of a, of a financial plan. However, we need to break that down, uh, and we, so that needs to be broken down into, does that mean retirement in terms of accumulation for retirement? Does that mean retirement in terms of ins uh, insurance, in terms of income uh, after retirement? What does that mean, or what do we need to start looking at and planning for? A financial plan will help one to look forward to say, if we want to live in a lifestyle that includes traveling and keep maintaining our income. Uh, what does that look like for us as we sit now with our retirement assets? What do we need to do to ensure that we'll have the appropriate amount of monies at retirement? And when do we want to retire? Post-retirement, what does our income look like? What, uh, what can we plan on? We know we have one sure income resource, right? What is that? Social Security, right? We had Social Security. So your financial plan takes that as a component to build into that number one financial planning goal of retirement planning and says, how much in Social Security will you be looking at? How much income do we want to produce in retirement? Do we have a gap? Most likely, yes, with Social Security, right? We're probably going to have some form of gap. So what do we have? to ensure that we have uh, that gap uh, covered and filled. So that's the number one portion of a financial plan that people look to in order to gain direction. I said a minute ago for the couple of you that have financial plans already that you're working with, that's what I mean about the living, breathing document, living, breathing direction. It's going to change. It's going to change. Life happens and things happen to, to, to make it change. Every year, we should be looking at the financial plan to ensure that it still provides that long-term goal um, solution that, uh, that we set forth when we put the financial plan together. Please don't start a financial plan, just let it sit. Um, so that's the number one goal of, of financial planning. But writing down these, your goals, if, uh, if it's uh, making sure that you have uh, protection for your, for your children or grandchildren, you want to fund retire, uh, uh, college education for them, or other needs that you may have to, to protect and uh, provide assets for your family, um, that's usually the number two goal. The number three goal is looking at a financial plan for direction to take us uh, in a path that we would be able to um, uh, provide, uh, a, a, provide a, a growth of, um, of investments and a growth of wealth. Uh, and it's a wealth planning approach as well. So those, no, those are the three components of the financial plan which are usually the most critical part of it. But it talks about writing down those goals, and that's what a financial plan helps us to do. It helps us to document what those goals are, identify what resources we have to achieve those goals, and then set a direction for us going forward uh, to, uh, to ensure that we are, we are achieving the goals that we, that we have on our financial plan. The other bullet point on here is uh, the usage of someone professionally to help you. Why? There's a lot of resources out there. You can construct your financial plan online for free or maybe something. Um, you can go to resources that, that are much, much uh, easier, user-friendly even, for you. But there's two things that someone professional will do for you. And it doesn't matter if, if it's a family physician, right? And we can't, can't cure ourselves. Uh, that's the most obvious. It doesn't matter if it's um, uh, looking at uh, protecting our home and our assets through, through insurance, like um, you know, home insurance, auto insurance, or something like that. Um, we tend to find when we look at, or a financial plan, we tend to find that we look at individuals as a second set of eyes, as a second mind, 
and to help us keep on track. Help us keep on track. Um, so if we DIY everything, do it yourself everything, uh, typically what we'll find is that we start and we have greatest intentions to, to have good strong auto home coverage, good strong retirement planning focus, good strong investment plan, and suddenly six months passes by and life takes over. And then a year passes by and it's like, well, yeah, I'm still kind of, you know, I, I, should, I should be okay. Two years, three years, five years passes by and says, I don't know, but I just haven't gotten back to that yet. Using someone professionally, number one, will give you that second, that second set of eyes, a second mind to help, you, to help you put the plan together, right? Put a plan together to identify the goals that you may have and identify resources to help you achieve your goals. Secondly, it kind of holds you accountable. It kind of holds you accountable. When you hear from your either financial advisor or your insurance person for your auto home and, and other areas that you have insured, when you hear from that person, you're like, oh yeah. And when they say, you know, we really should get together 30 minutes just to review, just to make sure we're on the right path, just to make sure that it's going the direction that we need to go. I'm like, okay, I can, I can spend 30 minutes of my time, sure. And you have that second set of eyes and mind working for you to hold yourself accountable to ensure that it doesn't just fall by the wayside three, five years passes by and, and it's really not as relevant of a plan or a focus or coverage or what you need it to achieve for you as what, what you first set out. So we would ask you, look for a professional with a financial plan who can help you uh, create the plan, who can help you stay on track it can help you hold yourselves accountable uh, for ensuring that it continues to, to work for you to achieve your goals. Because goals will change, life changes, and you will need to um, look at ways in which you can continue to, um, uh, to grow your plan. Does that make sense to everyone? Let's look at um, the investing. I said a few minutes ago that you all are investors, so congratulations. You're in the markets, and markets are doing pretty well, right? You probably saw your 401k going up, hopefully. Yes. If you're not, then come see me afterwards because there's something going on there. Um, and, but uh, nothing goes up forever, right? Housing, markets, whatever. It doesn't go up forever. So making sure that uh, you have um, uh, the types of uh, investments within your retirement plan, within your financial plan, that you can construct to, um, to ensure that it's doing, uh, achieving what you want it to achieve and that you expect it to achieve. Retirement plan is an uh, area that you use for uh, investments. Higher education planning, whether it's a 529 plan for kids or grandchildren to help them get through the expenses of college. Um, life and long-term care insurance, I talk, talked about that. You use investments to, to ensure that you have protection for your life and long-term care needs and uh, options for creating retirement income outside of your employer retirement planning um, income production. In other words, I'm putting money into something that's going to you know, spitting out income to me so I can make sure that I can maintain the lifestyle and the income that, uh, that I want to achieve. So that's the options that you have usually to, to invest. And then we have the, the risk and return, and I'll spend just a moment on this because I think we're at a time now, and with your 401k and other investment accounts that you may have, to make sure that we're not living in this euphoric state that uh, it's, everything's going to go up and everything's going to continue to grow. I'm going to get another 16% return from, you know, we had 16% return in the markets from November to April or whatever it was, right? Uh, so I was like, really, that's, that's sustainable, right? Um, we're, we've been fortunate to where it's kind of just flattened out and continued to, to improve, but it doesn't last forever. So what I see happen much uh, of the time when, when markets and, and investments are doing well is that speculative returns are where people tend to start putting their money because they hear about the, the strong growth. They can't go wrong. Everything is going well. Everything is going up. Speculative is a uh, higher risk. On this side of the chart you see as possible returns go up, so does possible risk. What does risk mean? Just what I talked about in the beginning. Prices go down, prices go up. With speculative investing, that's areas like um, uh, you know, small company stocks that may be here today and gone tomorrow, um, junk bonds and high yield type of bonds to where suddenly you get 8% on a, on, a, on a bond. That's real, right? We know where interest rates are. So anytime you see things like that and you say, well, 
wow, that looks like a good return. You see a sign on the street that says, put your money, retirement money in here, and you get 7% return interest on your money. I'm conservative. I run for the hills. I'm like, I don't think so. There's something going on behind that curtain that I want to be careful of. <laughs> Speculative. Growth is a little less in terms of volatility and risk, but it still has some risk to it. Growth, there are areas like uh, company stock that is reasonably strong, but still depends upon growth of their organization to, to help their stock prices uh, continue to increase. Then we have income through bonds and other areas of income production, mostly bonds, uh, U.S. Treasury bonds, corporate bonds, things of that nature. A little less volatility risk, but still when interest rates move up, prices of bonds move down. And then lastly, asset protection, which is complete, fixed, guaranteed, won't move, but probably don't provide a tremendous amount of interest. Where are interest rates at today that are guaranteed, right? 1%, maybe you get lucky, you get one and a half, maybe you're not so lucky, you get a half a percent. So it's um, those types of guarantees where you can sleep well at night, where you're not earning anything at night. So that a, 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 can be part of a portfolio, but still at the same time understanding it's very limited in its potential. And then lastly, um, again, plugging the financial advisor um, because while investing, things change very quickly. And I would say the, uh, you're looking at your investment profile, like I mentioned at the beginning, your retirement plan. Don't let it just sit on the shelf and let it go uh, because you may find some surprises down the road that you weren't expecting. So making sure that you're updating or at least reviewing your, your plan, your portfolio, your retirement plan to ensure that it's doing what's, what's going on. And as you sit down with someone professionally to review your uh, retirement plan, and focus through your employer plan or anything else that you have, then discussion of life changes, discussion of what your goals are, have they, have they remained the same, and is there anything on the horizon that we need to be talking about uh, that uh, we could bring to the table or could be brought to the table to help you continue to, uh, uh, to develop a good uh, financial future for yourselves. So, Utilization of a financial advisor is, is a good idea. Um, if there's costs involved, uh, you should uh, 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 discover what those costs are and have that upfront conversation uh, before you decide to work with someone. Um, I think there should be an open, uh, open discussion about that and transparency about if there's any cost of working with a financial advisor. Often there's not. Often there's not, uh, but tied to a financial institution, tied to maybe other investments that you may make in the future, um, that they could receive compensation for, for those types of activities. So I'd invite you to think, think strongly about utilization of a financial advisor or professional. Um, turn it over to you guys. Now we ended right on the half hour here on the 30 minute and I'd like to turn it over for discussion uh, or questions that you may have. I understand if you have to leave because lunch time is through. I get it. Um, but uh, for those of you who do have to leave, thank you very much for your time. You. Hope it's been helpful. If we can help you at STCU in any way, um, please uh, let us know. Wade, you had something? Yeah, just a comment. Just a reminder that Cigna does offer a free will, uh, will service. So if you haven't developed your will or you haven't reviewed it yet, then our uh, EAP through Cigna uh, has that service for a free will creation and review by their legal team. That's, that's great. I mean, if you have that, that uh, resource available to you, please use it. It's, um, it's, it, do it use it maybe a, a, once a year. Just take a look, quick look uh, from somebody professionally who can help what you. What were the three things that were supposed to be identified in your annual plan? Um, Retirement focus is, is uh, for your financial plan, you mean your retirement focus, um, insu ensuring the assets of your, um, uh, of, your, of your property or your family stability, and lastly, creation of wealth. In other words, just how do I continue to put money to work for me that uh, develops a stronger level of wealth? Does that make sense? Thank you very much for your time. Michael, did you already uh, mention how STCU can help out with a financial plan for free? No, I didn't. In fact, that would be probably one of the last things that I'd want to uh, offer to any of um any of you is that uh, at STCU we have resources to develop a, a financial plan with you and and for you but mostly with you uh, to sit down and look at your situation identify the goals that we talked about earlier and be able to uh, put a financial plan together for you we don't charge we don't charge for our financial planning um, that we work with our members and so it is a complimentary service that we bring uh, to to our membership 
Um, so if you're interested, uh, my card is on the edge of the table over there. You can pick a, a card up and uh, contact me and let me know. We have financial advisors uh, dotted throughout the branch locations of STCU who can set up a time to meet and uh, just have a personal discussion about your financial plan. Uh, we provide it through um, a resource which gives us kind of an electronic delivery uh, that we can continue to update and uh, you can always have access to 24-7 to look at your plan and, and see what, uh, what goals that you developed and even have the opportunity to, to change some of those goals or update some of those goals. So we made it very user-friendly for, for our members. So again, if you'd like to look at a, uh, uh, the discussion around a financial plan, uh, please pick up my card. I'll also reach out to you and thank you for coming uh, and you can bounce back to me on an email or something and, and let me know if there's uh, something that we can do to help you. Thank you. What is the living trust? Living trust is a legal document that um, gives you definition for your assets that you have, such as a home and, uh, and other assets that you may have. It also provides and incorporates a will into the living trust, which then provides direction for you and for all your, uh, your estate. But um, then you take your living trust uh, as a, um, a way to title title your, your assets like your home and, and other uh, large assets that you have so that everything is now owned by your living trust. But don't worry, because you're the trustees of the Living Trust, so ultimately it's obviously still yours. It's not owned by something else, but it's a document that then uh, it provides direction for all of uh, your assets that you can put under uh, a Living Trust. Um, then it will also have some other initiatives that, that can be incorporated, such as a medical initiative and other things that can be incorporated into your Living Trust uh, to provide total direction for you, for your assets, and for your will, all bundled into a, a package. Uh, the benefits that other people have seen is that it uh, avoids the, kind of the probating in a lot of cases, can't guarantee that that's the case, but often it does uh, avoid uh, probating and has some other um, financial and maybe even tax um, issues that, that are benefits, but that's really a legal discussion an accountant discussion, wouldn't want to throw that out there, just, just uh, grossly throw that out and say that that could be a benefit as well. But there are times to where it can be a benefit to have um, titling of a living trust over your assets for that sort of protection as well. Again, legal accounting discussion. So does a living trust go away when you die or can it stay in existence after you die? It can because you can actually establish it as a family living trust so it's not just personalized to, to one unique individual or other um, type of living trust that, that would continue to live beyond you, yes. Beneficiaries, uh, uh, trustees, um, uh, uh, and, and uh, 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 secondary trustees could then take over the uh, the the, uh, esta uh, the estate plan and the living trust. Yes, so it could continue to live and breathe beyond your lifespan. Wait, would Cigna do that also? Or just, uh, I don't think they have quite that level. Um, I know that the, the living will, or the uh, li the will piece. I'm not sure that it has the living will component, but I'm not sure that it doesn't either. Something to ask, and uh, we can also uh, at least provide some some resources or a direction if you're interested there as well. Other questions? Sir? Uh, financial advisors you mentioned STCU has, are they certified finan financial? Are they certified financial planners or just uh, have a title of financial advisor? Do they fall under the recently enacted fiduciary? Rule, if I got that right? Yes, uh, the, the answers are, are, are yes. Uh, they're certified for, for uh, financial planning. Uh, there are There is a designation of certified financial planner, a CFP, which uh, our advisors are not, but they're certified for uh, retirement planning services, and they do um, act as fiduciaries under the new DOL arrangement, and they have been appropriately licensed, trained, and then um, uh, certified for that level to, to provide fiduciary advice. Yes. The follow-up, there is there is no commission or fee 
for at least the introductory services. Right? Correct. There's no uh, there's no fees or any sort of uh, a compensation agreement of any sort to sit down and talk to one of our financial advisors who can even develop a financial plan with you, which we also don't have any cost to our members. Execution of any sort of investments that are perhaps made could trigger, uh, but it's fully disclosed, could trigger a, a fee or maybe some form of expense that uh, would then compensate the financial advisor, but before you even tiptoe into those waters, it's, uh, it's something that doesn't come back to haunt you later. It's fully disclosed and fully transparent, which is part of the DOL uh, fiduciary responsibility. If that makes sense. Kind of talk a little jargon there, but, but uh, you, you, you know, you understand, and there's no, um, there's no smoke and mirrors. Certainly not. Um, not from STCU, anyway. Any other questions? I hope it's been helpful. I know it's high level. I'd like to keep it that, that way, especially for a 30 minute, 35 minute conversation. I thank you very much uh, for coming. Again, my card is on the table if you'd like to reach out to me directly. I'd like to just touch base with you electronically just to uh, give you my contact information if you should so need it. And I certainly appreciate uh, your time. And I, again, I hope this was helpful for you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for coming, guys. Thank you.